Hey guys, welcome to your next video in the series. So this is Calgrimetry with Charvella. Um, so you guys will be doing a Calgrimetry lab coming up and this will hopefully give you the background you need to know in order to do that. Um, so Calgrimetry um, uses a Calgrimeter. Um, it is a device that is designed to uh, measure how much heat is associated with the chemical reaction um, so how much heat is given off as you do this reaction um, is measured. You measure the change in temperature and use that to figure out what that total energy value is. Um, so it is used in finding something called enthalpy, which is delta H. Uh, we have not talked about enthalpy too much, so this will kind of introduce enthalpy a little bit for you guys. Um, it's something we'll talk more in depth in class um, and maybe future videos as well. Um, and what you're doing is there'll be this enthalpy value, this, this energy value, and it's going to cause a temperature change in a known substance, usually water, um, sometimes it's air, it just depends on how the calorimeter is set up. Uh, for you guys, lab-wise, it should be water. Um, in the lab you guys are doing, there's this uh, cylinder right here, which for you guys will be a um, styrofoam cup. Um, so you'll have a styrofoam cup right here, um, most likely a temperature probe or a thermometer, and you'll have some reaction that takes place and you'll record that temperature change. Um, we'll show you more of what this looks like in practice later on. Uh, one of the other things is the assumption here that the calorimeter is a closed system. So we assume that whatever energy value is happening here stays within this container and within the system. The, everything inside that container should be the system itself. Um, so you have the system, it should not affect the surroundings at all. Um, so we'll talk more about what you'll do, you'll, you'll do with this for lab-wise later on, but um, that's your basic introduction to calorimetry. Um, as I said in the last slide, it is one of the ways to solve enthalpy problems. It's not the only one. So there's five total ways to solve enthalpy problems. This is just the first of those five. So we're going to kind of ignore that all these exist for right now. Um, so this is way one. Every single way to solve an enthalpy problem is different depending on what information the problem gives you. In this case, the problem will need to tell you three things. You'll need to know some mass value, you'll need to know C, which is specific heat capacity, and then you'll need to know a change in temperature. So if those three things are not there, then it has to be one of these other problem types that I crossed out. All of the problems you're going to see in this video are all calorimetry though, so they should all have mass values, um, specific heat values, and change in temperature. So solving these out, um, you should have seen this equation for phase change. Uh, it's the same equation, so Q equals MC delta T, or Q equals MCAT, um, as we affectionately like to call it. Um, so Q is going to be the heat. M is the mass of whatever substance you're dealing with. Since it's calorimetry, that's probably the known substance, which is probably water and then C is going to be the specific heat capacity of that material. So in the case of water, um, that is 4.18 joules per gram degree Kelvin. Um, since one degree Kelvin is also one degree Celsius, this can also be joules per gram times degree Celsius. Same thing, because one degree Celsius is one degree Kelvin. And then, of course, delta T is the change in temperature. So final temperature minus initial temperature. Um, so delta T is generally equal to T final minus T initial. There's going to be times that we change that around just to avoid negatives, but I'll talk about that as we hit those different problems. So. For the rest of this, for the most part, it's just getting used to solving these kind of problems. 
So very first problem to look at. The specific heat capacity of iron is 0 0.450 joules per gram degree Kelvin. Um, so this problem tells us C. It also tells us the mass that we are dealing with. And it tells us um, if that block of iron is changing from uh, it's changing from 25 degrees Celsius to 88.5 degrees Celsius. So we know change in temp, we know mass, and we know C. Uh, so we can just kind of plug this in. Now, this mass right here is in kilograms. And since we are solving for grams, for when our C value here is grams, we need those two to agree. So it's easier to change this kilogram value. So 1.05 kilograms is equal to 1,050 grams. <clears throat> From there, we just plug it all in. So Q equals MC delta T. So 1,050 grams times our C value. times change in temperature. So the final temperature was 88.5 degrees and our initial temperature was 25 degrees. So plug and chug Q in this case uh, should end up equaling 3.00 times 10 to the fourth joules. <clears throat> so that's pr pretty straightforward. Um, some of these problems will look at uh, a few more factors involved. Um, so this one's pretty straightforward because there's only one thing to look at. Alright, so next problem to look at. This time we have a little bit more involved here. So we have sodium hydroxide that is being dissolved in 100 grams of water and the water's temperature is rising from 23.6 degrees Celsius to 47.5 degrees Celsius. So this is where we have an unknown affecting a known substance. And we want to solve for delta H. And delta H, so enthalpy, is kilojoules per mole. Um, so we have 9.5 grams of this sample, and we are going to figure out what, <clears throat> how many joules of energy were involved and how many kilojoules. And I'm just going to change the page set up here really quickly. So the first thing to look at here, we know what the how much energy was absorbed by the water. So we can use water to figure out how much energy was given off and then we can kind of go from there. Um, so the key thing here is that the energy released from this salt, so from sodium hydroxide, should equal the energy absorbed by the water. Uh, this should be a closed system. That's why we assume that calorimeters are closed systems because these two things need equal. So um, energy really should equal energy absorbed. So from them there, we can figure this whole thing out. So the energy absorbed by the water, so Q for water, is going to equal our 100 grams of water the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 and then we know that the temperature change is 47.4 minus 23.6 so we can plug and chug of this whole thing um, and we end up getting a positive 9948.4 joules. It's positive because it's absorbed energy. 
So um, that means that if uh, we, this also is going to equal the energy released, well, the energy released by sodium hydroxide is the same value, but because it's a released energy, it's going to be negative. So that same value, just turn it into negative joules released. And since we are trying to solve for delta H, well, we know how many joules, but we also need to, uh, delta H is kilojoules per mole, so we need to change joules into kilojoules. So just take this whole thing, divide it by 1,000, so that gives us negative 9.9484 kilojoules. Okay. Um, from there, uh, the only thing we've left that we need to know is how many moles of sodium hydroxide were involved. Well, going back up to the top here, um, we see that we have 9.5 grams of sodium hydroxide that was dissolved originally. So this number divided by moles, and moles in this case is 9.55 grams for every one mole of sodium hydroxide there is 40 grams so that means that we have 0.23875 moles which we can plug in right there And that means that delta H okay so this value equals delta H um, and the value there is going to be 41.7 kilojoules per mole so fairly straightforward for that problem okay now this problem is a little bit more complicated. So we have two different water solutions. So we have hot water mixing with cold water. So we have 125 milliliters of water at 88 degrees Celsius and 50 milliliters of water at 30 degrees Celsius. And up at the top it says that heat loss by hot water is equal to heat gained by cold water. So both of these when they mix there should be an exchange of energy, the cold water should warm up, the hot water should cool down, and the entire system should end up at a total temperature. So the final temperature for both sides of this um, should be the same. So because of that, we can set these two equations equal to each other. So, actually I don't want to write Q. Um, so that means that MC delta T for cold water is going to equal MC delta T for hot water. We can plug in the values. The one thing that we want to avoid though is we want to make sure that both sides of this equation are either positive or negative. Um, the hot water is losing energy, the cold water is absorbing it, so if we were to treat delta T as final minus initial for both sides, we'd end up with a positive value on one side or a negative value on the other, and that's not helpful. Um, so we're just going to try to make sure that delta T is positive in both sides of this equation so that we have a positive equaling a positive. Uh, from there, we just plug in the values that we have. So. Um, the very first one, our cold water here, uh, we have 50 grams um, times 4.18. And change in temperature, we don't know what that value is, but we know that the final temperature will be higher than the initial temperature. 
because the cold water is heating up. So delta T will be positive if we do x minus 30. And if we look at this kind of on a scale, we know that if this is 30 degrees and this is 88 degrees, our x value for these, when these two things mix, will be somewhere in the middle. And probably closer to 88 because we have more of that, of the hot water than we do cold water. So from there, this whole thing equals, let's see, 125. Actually, let me make that red. So 125. Same C value. And this time, in order to make it positive, we're going to do 88 minus x. Because again, that x value is somewhere between these two. So to make this a positive value, it should be that the initial minus final this time. Now, one thing that you'll notice here is there's this value of 4.18 on both sides. And because it's on both sides of the equation, we can just kind of cross it out. Um, make life a little bit easier for ourselves. From there, plug and chug to solve for x. So that means that we are going to end up with 50x minus 1,500 equals 125x. Actually, sorry, that's wrong. Equals 11,000 minus 125x. Um, from there, we can move like terms. Uh, so you'll end up with 175x equals uh, 12,500. So x equals 71.4 degrees Celsius. And all of it's said and done. So the new temperature of the entire system is 71.4 degrees Celsius. Okay, um, this is a similar problem. Uh, so in a coffee cup, we have um, two solutions. So we have a silver nitrate solution and a hydrochloric acid solution. Um, 50 milliliters of both, and they're mixed to yield some pre precipitate. So the two solutions were initially at 22.6 degrees, and the final temperature is 23.4 degrees. Um, and it wants to know what the... So first thing we need to do is write, write out the net ionic equation. So um, silver nitrate and uh, hydrochloric acid. So the net ionic equation will be Ag plus plus Cl minus produces AgCl solid. Okay, second part of this problem is asking us to calculate the heat that accompanies this reaction in kilojoules per mole, which again is delta H. So we are solving here for delta H of forming this AgCl. So we can figure out, first we need to figure out how many joules of energy are involved. And going back up, we see that there are two solutions. So we're mixing 50 mils of one solution and 50 mils of another and both of these are dissolved in water. So water is our known value here. Um, water is going to increase its temperature. We can use the energy that is absorbed by the water to solve for the energy released when the salt is formed. Um, so there's going to be, as this reaction happens, there's going to be some release of energy here. So it's also going to give off energy. And we'll use water to solve for that energy to find delta H. So looking at what we know about the water, we have 
100 grams of water because two um, things of 50 milliliters, each milliliter of water is one gram. Um, so grain total of 100 milliliters, so 100 grams. C for water is 4.18. And then that temperature change, uh, it's 23.4 is the final temperature and 22.6 is the initial temperature. Um, so plugging and checking, Q in this case is 334.4 joules. And that's the water that is, that's the energy that is absorbed by the water. So in terms of the salt, the salt is going to be releasing negative 334.4 joules. But going back up here, delta H is kilojoules, so converting that to kilojoules is negative 0.334 kilojoules of energy. better. Okay. Um, so since it's per mole, we also need to know how many moles of salt are formed. Uh, we can use the two solutions above to figure that out. So they're both 0.1 molar solutions and there's 50 mils. So that means that the uh, mole value of the salt formed is going to be 0 0.005 moles of salt. So delta H in this case is 66.9 kilojoules per mole. And that should be negative. So again, all of these calorimetry problems, you're using a known substance and its specific heat in order to solve for the energy value associated with a chemical reaction. So in this case, we used water to solve for the energy released by forming a GCO. Um, this is another similar problem. This one's nice because it's just this, just looking at silver. So there's it gives you C value for silver, so it's just a pretty much straight Q equals MCAT. Um, and I'm not going to walk through this whole problem, but the one thing that's worth pointing out in this problem is this right here. So molar heat capacity. In part B, it asks to calculate um, the rays and temperature of one mole of AGCL by one degree. So basically, you're just taking this specific heat capacity, which is um, degree Celsius per gram, so joules time divided by degree Celsius per gram. And you're figuring out how much energy would be associated with one mole, and you just use the molar mass. So for silver, there's about, 100, um, about 108 grams or so per mole. Uh, so you just take the specific heat, capac heat capacity and figure out what that would be for 108 grams instead of just one gram. Okay, um, changing the view here really quick. Uh, calorimetry can also be used to determine the specific heat capacity of metals. So if you have a metal, you can heat it up to some known temperature, throw it into um, water, use the heat gained by the water, uh, and its final temperature in order to figure out how much energy was released by the metal. And then you can solve for the specific heat of that metal and maybe use it to, def uh, to identify the metal as well. So an example problem is three grams of some unknown metal is heated to 95 degrees Celsius. It's added to a cup of water um, and you know the change in temperature of the water. So this is one of those times when you just put the two equations equal to each other. So um, MC delta T of the metal is going to equal M 
can see delta T of the water. And plug and check. So that's three grams. We are solving for C, so this is our unknown. Um, again, we want both sides of this equation to be positive, so delta T here should be uh, 95 minus X because X will be less than um, that value. And over here, uh, it's just going to be 50 grams. C for water again is 4.18. And then the change in temperature, we know that it went from 30 to 23. And actually, I just realized the other mistake I made is this. We know what this value is because the final temperature of the metal and the water should be the same. So this should actually be 30 degrees Celsius. So from there, we can plug and chug this whole thing. So C equals 50 times 4.18 times 30 minus 23. over 3.0 times 95 minus 30. And our nice grand total number here is that C is 7.5. Joules per gram times degrees Celsius. Okay, very last slide to look at here. Uh, another problem, so again, an unknown sample is mixed with water. We know what the temperature of the, the original temperature of the metal is and the original temperature of the water. So this is a good one for you guys to practice out by yourself. Um, so I'm gonna pause for just a second, let you guys look at that, and then I'll write out the answer. Okay, so assuming you guys pause the video um, and tried this out for yourself, C for this unknown metal should equal 0.24 joules per gram degrees Celsius. Um, so that concludes this video. Sorry, it was a little, little bit long on this one. Um, let us know if you have any more questions. And have a good rest of your day. Yeah.